This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and you can find me at Conquers3 on Twitter. And I'm here with my good colleague at Wheelie Dealer, Peter, on Twitter. And this is podcast number 62. And Pete and I have been looking at the markets and we're not quite sure what's going on. We've been up, we've been down, we've been sideways over the past... Um, couple of weeks since the, the last podcast Pete so um, what are your thoughts and how you doing fella yeah yeah well I'm I'm, um, I'm ticking over I mean you know on my health I'll, I'll just do a very very fast health update um, they've worked out that I've actually got a bladder stone and that's what's been causing the pain all this time I'm now waiting on my consultant to tell me what they're going to do about it and you know what the waiting time's going to be etc so you know I'm sort of in this limbo situation where I'm waiting for something but but I'm pretty pleased because you know a bladder stone yeah it's not it's not great and I'm fed up with the pain but it could have been a lot worse you know so you got to look at the positives you, you do have to look at the positives Pete but it doesn't stop you and me given the number of conversations that we're having uh, about well, exactly. your health, um, yeah. you know, off the podcast and on the phone a couple of times a week, how how poor the situation is at the minute regarding waiting lists and and people that actually need the care getting the care at the moment. Yeah, it's 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 a horrendous backlog as, as we know. Um, yeah, so so the yeah the markets are strange. I mean, it it seems I was I would say it's a very sort of flaccid market. It's sort of. It's sort of neither one thing nor the other, and it sort of it doesn't want to really go up. But in the UK, you know, it doesn't really want to go up, and it doesn't really want to go down either. And it's just this sort of sort of grinding, pretty, you know, tedious kind of market. I, I mean, I was trying to rationalise it earlier and think, well, what the hell's going on? And it strikes me. I mean, a lot of it is low volume. You know, when you look at some of the stocks, there's just no volume in them whatsoever. And it strikes me there's a lack of conviction from bulls to be buying anything. But equally, on the other side, there's a lack, lack of conviction from bears to be selling anything. And we just seem to be in this kind of weird standoff where neither side, you know, the, the bears can't smash the market down and the bulls can't push the market up. And we just seem to be going through this really tedious grind, really. Yeah, it's been it's been a very interesting couple of couple of weeks, really. I think the the fascinating thing for me at the moment is that you know the the FTSE 100 has been really really helped by oil prices, energy prices going higher. Uh, Royal Dutch Shell has really helped in that in that in that regard over the past uh, weeks or so. And I'm looking and doing my score run, um, you know, almost every day. And I'm looking at I'm looking at the petrol station. And it's inching up and inching up and inching up. And I said to my daughter only about a week ago, you know, as well as talking about COP26, I said, just watch that, Evs. I said, you know, a couple of days, you know, or a week or so, that'll be touching over 150. And lo and behold, yesterday, it, the petrol station we drive past the ESSO was at 151.9. And I recall when we were, when it was, you know, 97 something or other, when we had that little, yeah. when the oil prices was, was at, what it's, what is, was at its bottom, Pete, right. when it got spanked a little while ago. Right. It was sub one. You can get less than a pound somewhere, couldn't you? You know. I can remember it was seventy five pence a gallon, and well, there's five liters to a gallon. It's so short age now, though, Pete. But I'm, oh, but I'm about you know, just a couple of years ago. We had that negative sort of reading on the futures market for for oil. Remember that crude oil being negative? Absolutely. I mean, I heard I heard on the news today. They said that you know the petrol price is the highest it's ever been. Because yeah. we're recording this on the Tuesday. We normally do it on a Wednesday, but we're doing it on Tuesday, sixteenth of November, and it's the evening now. Yeah. And um, yeah, they said you know it's the highest petrol price at the forecourt has ever been, and and you sort of think, well, hang on, oil prices have been a lot higher than that. So I think a lot of it is the pound dollar rate affecting things, as, as but well, also it's taxation. You know, there's more yeah. and more tax going on all the time, and and and, and, and inflation, mate, and inflation. So we had the the FTSE touching 
a 52 week high uh, and and beyond that um, at um, 7384 that was on the 7th of this month yeah so just um, where are we nine days ago nine trading days ago uh, nine days no, that's ago, just trading days ago yeah I thought it had done it a few days ago. I'll have to have a quick look. Yeah, my... yeah, it, it was on. It was on the eleventh. On, on the uh, no, sorry, I'm getting my days all all mixed yeah, up. I was going to say, I apologize. That. On yeah. the eleventh of the eleventh, which is last week, middle of yeah. last week. So um, last, what would that be? Last Wednesday, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last Tuesday, last Tuesday. Uh, and that was that was a new fifty-two week high, which is actually quite bullish behaviour. Yeah, and we sort of pulled back from that in the last few days. But overall, the trend on the FTSE 100 does still seem to be up. And, and interestingly, before we did this call, just out of interest, because the market had been sort of a bit gr sort of grotty today, I thought, well, I'll have a look and see what the FTSE 250, the FTSE small cap and whatever are doing. And all of those are still within, you know, I love the 13 stroke 21 day EMA, yeah. exponential moving average. All of those have done bull crosses and are still nicely within those bull crosses. So, so that still tells us that actually we shouldn't really be panicking that much, although it does feel like a really funny market. I, I don't think we should be panicking much, mate. I, you know, we're, we're a lot higher than we've been um, for for quite a while. And if you look at the six, if you if you, if you zoom, zoom out a little bit, and you've only got to look at the six month chart, and and back in July. We were sitting there wondering whether is you know whether we're going to get back above seven thousand. We're at six thousand eight hundred back in mm -hmm. July, and and back again in um, let's have a look here. In September, we we're sitting at six thousand nine hundred. So we've come a, a fair way in a very short space of time since um, the twentieth of September, when we were sitting there uh, last time at sub um, at sub seven thousand. So we've done it at three or four hundred points. Um, we're sitting near. Or within touching distance of um, you know of of highs, um, we've got that February high peak before we the market capitulated in 2020. February yeah. 2020, it was seven four six six. That's what we need to get over and above. And when yeah. we see seven thousand five hundred at some point, we'll know that we're we're on on, on the on the grips of um, getting over that you know capitulation we had. Um, when the COVID things all kicked off in 2020. And then we need to get over. The next hurdle above that is the 2020, 2020 high of 7,675, there or thereabouts. Yeah. Then we can start talking about 8,000 at some point. Um, but, you know, people that are, are sitting out there waiting for a Christmas rally will have to see, you know, which, which turkeys get, you know, sacrificed because we've got a lot of other walls of worry to actually get past between now and that Santa rally, I think. Yeah, well, you know, again, I was sort of thinking about it before we did the call, and and I was trying to think back to other years, and do you know what? When I when I sort of think about it, I remember a lot of Novembers and a lot of early Decembers being a bit like this and not being that exciting, and 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 you sort of and everyone saying, "When's the Santa rally? When's the Santa rally?" and everyone sort of seems to think that december just is the santa rally which you know it just isn't the, the santa rally tends to actually take place from something like the 17th of december through that sort of period was it twixtmas between christmas and and yeah between christmas yeah, yeah. and new year it's essentially the, the from the midpoint of the month towards the latter part of the month is yeah we won't get just, it. just more frequent, we frequently get it yeah yeah, just into January. And that tends to be an amazing time when there's no volume, but the markets just seem to drift up. And that, that happens with such incredible regularity. So what I'm saying is it's pretty normal for this time of year actually to be a little bit funny. Mm -hmm. And as you said, there's so many, you know, we've got lots of concerns around COVID over on the continent. I noticed today that I've got shares in on the beach, OTB. That got smacked today. And obviously what's not helping that is, you know, they've, is it Munich has cancelled the um, the October, you know, the Christmas thing. Yeah, that would have been cancelled for a while though, Pete, to be fair. No, 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 no. They, no, no, they announced today that the Christmas market's being shut. Oh, the Christmas market. I yeah, and that's October really big news. And that's, be, yeah. that's because of COVID. And it's yeah. like, it's like Europe has got a lot of COVID going on. So stocks like On the Beach, which obviously rely on travel, 
and it's going to hurt airlines and what you know they're all they're all finding it hard again and and you know we're going to hear the drumbeat over here of you know we should have more lockdowns we're going to hear it all and that just you know gets that's another reason for the market to be jittery and as you said high oil prices you've got the supply problems you've got the inflation you've got the shortage of people there are so many things in this wall of worry that it's very hard for the for the market to really charge on you know it is. I mean, I was I was I was taken a a, a back really with some of the news I've seen in, in Europe regarding COVID. I've tried my best not to uh, to get impacted by it too much, um, in a sense of hoping they'll sort themselves out. But you know, we've equally got to look after uh, ourselves and sort ourselves out here in a sense of looking after people. Um, I've got friends who are, are a certain age, and and I'm not that far away from them, and mm. they they're having their their covid booster jabs and their flu jab at the same time i'm going oh my gosh i said i'm not doing all that in one day no chance you know what i mean wow. <laughs> i want to if i'm gonna have one i'll have one and then see how i get on and then i might have the other one another time i'm, I'm not getting double double hit on a, on what on one day you know i'm just too you know gentle for that mate too sensitive no, well i well mate i've got it booked up that this friday a nurse, <laughs> a nurse is coming around and give me one in one arm one in the other <laughs> I, d- I just want it all out of the way. I, I mean, I, well, you know, well, please, they want to stick a third needle somewhere else, carry oh, on, you know what I mean? Yeah, I just... Mate, eat to their own, mate. What you do yeah. in your private time, Pete, that's entirely up to you, but eat to their own, mate, eat to their own. Right, I want to, I want to talk about some stocks that have, have really done well, Pete. Oh, um, and, you... and I'm really, really pleased as well because, you know, I think I've been one of the people that have knocked it, that the, the management, the ever-changing, you know, revolving door of management really haven't sorted themselves out yeah um, but uh, having watched um marks and spencers um hit a pound yeah and still thought mm, i'm not quite feeling it yeah it was really good last week to see m s just absolutely smash it out of the park and the shares um over the past month they're up 26 percent um they're up at um two pounds 32 as we speak and they seem to be sorting themselves out, Pete. You know, I'm not sure, um, you know, whether it's got, as they say, you know, a lot of longevity in a sense of it's going to carry on and carry on and carry on climbing. But I think a lot of people were surprised by the moves last week and the, the day that was. Came out of that. You know, I'm really pleased for people that hold that share um, and held and held or averaged down with that share because it's it's done them well. Um, how long can it continue? I don't know. Uh, but it was nice to see them have a nice pop, and I think the pop it was also helped because I'm sure there were some shorters in that stock, mate, for oh, that yeah. for that to have that move that day. Um, so I'm chuffed. One twelve years up, twelve sorry, twelve months up eighty three percent, Pete. A year to date up sixty nine percent. I've not seen that ramped by anybody. Uh, so there you go. That's another one um, quietly going about its business that everyone knows about, but not that many people hold a stock. MKS is the stock. I'm looking now on SharePad at it, and it's it's interesting that, you know, when you look at the raw numbers in terms of the forecast and stuff, they're talking about forecast PE of 12.2 and a two-year forecast PE of 12.8. There's there's only a tiny dividend yield expected next year, 0.3%, but in two years, it's up to 3.2. And it's a a funny one, isn't it? Because personally... I think I sort of in that camp of do I really trust it? Is this <laughs> is this is this a recovery that's really going to happen? I mean, I always said you know I always think the food business is brilliant, you know, and and it's so good. And I was all worried that recently they've they sort of ruined their own food business. It was almost getting a bit tainted. Mm. But um, lately, they you know they do seem to be more getting it together. But it's always been the problem around around the clothing, hasn't it? Where yeah, I just don't know. I just yeah. They're, they're sitting right now, Pete, at a three-year high. Yeah, yeah. They've not been this high um, it's, it's since, uh, June, since yeah June j- yeah. June um, twenty. So they they need to get above. Um, I think it's two seventy-two, two fifty, and they're going back to May twenty nineteen, mate. Yeah, yeah. That's not too bad for a retail company that's been on its on it. You know, on its absolute knees, praying for help. So I'm pleased for anybody that's that's endured that because all they've had is the dividends for X amount of years and the share price has just been on a, a dar- downward slope. Well, they haven't they haven't even had the dividends recently, have they? No, not recently. It's pretty. Yeah. I mean, overall, if you if you zoom, if you zoom out 
on on a chart basis um you're looking at um where are we now looking at 2007 it was seven pounds a share pete yeah, yeah. and 2000 and no, to 1991 it was 225 a share and if you've held it all that time mate and you get to um this last last september it was at 97 pence yeah well yeah, so, yeah. you know so i'm pleased for those that hold that stock and have held that stock or were brave enough to buy it at sub sub a pound 80 pence night sorry 89 you know, pence, 90 pence and above what, two, what, two, strikes, two. what strikes me with it now is you know i gotta ask myself the question would i buy it now and i i sort of when I sort of think, well, there's other stocks I'd probably rather have. And I think that's one of the, you know, it's always one of the challenges, isn't it? When you're looking at a particular stock, and especially if you don't feel really strong conviction on it, as would be the case with me and MKS, you know, it, yeah. It's, yeah, it looks good in terms of the chart. The numbers seem quite attractive. There does seem to be the start of a turnaround happening. But how many times have we heard that before? And, mm. I, and and then I sort of think all that in the round. And I, I also think well, it's on a forward PE, what did I say, around 12 or whatever it is. What is the real upside potential there? Could it stretch to a PE of maybe 18? So you could get sort of 50% out of it if, you, if you're lucky, if there's some upgrades and whatever. But a lot's got to go right for that to happen. And yeah, I, mean, I sort of think, you know, is there something else I'd rather have? And it probably is, to be honest. Yeah, the, yeah. Pro the problem is, mate. I mean, a similar, not dissimilar in the sense of being really unloved, and you know, you know, mm -hmm. everyone was absolutely giving it a, a shellacking. Was um, ITV again uh, last week? Got absolutely, you know, whoosh. Everybody wanted to buy it again because it yeah. came out with its with, with its um, brilliant sort of um, numbers regarding revenue rising and ad ad strength being coming back, and that absolutely jumped again. And and again, it's one of those sort of stocks that. You know, it's 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 trying. It's, it's been it's been getting in its own way for so long, Pete. You know, I I bought it when it was on its knees during the, during um, the lockdown sell off, and I sold it and and, and did quite well out of it. But I, I I'm, I'm not going back into it um, now, and I'm pleased that people that have kept it all that way through have, have done well. But it's it's not. You know, it's it's got a prospective yield of four point eight eight percent or there or thereabouts. Um, PE ratio is not too high. If they can get something sorted out with the streaming side of it, they might do well, you know. But yeah, do you know what? Year to date as well. When you talk about those two, out of those two, I'd far rather have ITV myself. Because That's it's just... digital, it's content, it's something you can see, touch it, and you can see that you can almost see their progress more regularly than you can yeah, with them and, and you SP. Can, you, know. you can imagine it. You can imagine it actually achieving it and succeeding. Wherever with m and S, there's been so many false dawns. It just I mean, I'm looking now at ITV, and it's un unbelievable. It's on a forecast PE of 8.4, and then two-year forecast PE of 8.3. The fact that those two numbers are so similar, 8.4, 8.3, yeah. tells me that it could be that the forecasts are way too low, and it could, in that second year, it could beat the first year quite a lot if they're really getting to grips with the business. So, you know, throw in a Throw in the yield, as you said, 2.8% and rising to 46 It's a quite a nice dividend as well. So, yeah, of the two, I'd definitely have a... Yeah, I, it's, it's not it's not, not bad. And I think I think the beauty of, of, of ITV, obviously, is that they're, they're trying their level best to embrace all the all the tech and the digital stuff out there and, you know, streaming and all the rest of it. So they're at the forefront of that and need to be. Otherwise, they're just going to get eaten by everybody else, you know? Oh, um, totally. So, so they're trying their, their level best. You know best. what? You can't. The big theme that this throws up, that that as a generalised point, is that these kind of big stalwart companies, okay, some of them do go wrong, like Marconi that went bust and whatever. But in the main, these big stalwart companies have got a lot of sort of like institutional knowledge or some sort of cultural aspect that that they can recover after bad times. And we've seen it so many times, like Tesco's. Remember, Tesco's had bad times and it recovered. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so these sort of big behemoths, they go through bad periods, but, you know, probably 90% of them do actually come good again if, if you get your timing right and all the rest of it. Yeah, and and, and that's the beauty of it, of it. Sometimes you, you can't really, or well, I shouldn't say you can't, 
you've got to consider the fact that sometimes you are going to be in a very very cyclical stocks and you, you might be in it where the stock just doesn't perform for one year or two years or three years and mm -hmm. do you have the patience to hold on for that time for it to recover and unfortunately as you say pete some simply do not recover you know yeah yeah uh, people have been waiting for a long time for centrica to actually deliver um that's done well over the past month or so again because of energy prices and and all the rest of it and heating um and that's done well over the past month or so but it's absolutely been a dog for for several years now you know yeah for, for almost like for a decade or something yeah so it's one yeah. of them where oh, you, you're right you've got a feel for people holding stocks i think, I think it yeah we've talked a lot about averaging down and stuff and i think one of the things that it sort of sort of shouts to me is that when you get a big behemoth and it goes wrong you've got a chance of it actually in the future at some point recovering and i think that's the case with a lot of good small cap established quality small cap businesses but i think where it goes wrong is when you have your sort of real speculative high risk aim dare i say it kind of punts that when they go wrong they go wrong and they're dead you know they're not going to recover very i i I can hardly think of a of a of an aim stock that's blown up and then recovered. They just don't. They just die. And you know, yeah, I I think it's very rare for a piece of aim junk to recover. There, there have been the occasional ones, Pete, and I think unfortunately, I think what happens invariably is that the traders trade it. Um, they come, they're in and out of the stock, in and out of the stock, and the stock sometimes, as I've said to various people when they've asked me questions, the stock's not allowed to get out of its own way. It's not allowed to 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 get above certain um, uh, resistance levels on the chart or yeah. technical levels in the chart because the traders are in and out for five ten percent, and this is what I say to people: if you're going to have numerous um, individuals on your timeline or you're following them on your Twitter feed, and they are traders, don't be following them for investment advice or any advice or anybody for advice for that matter or for um, stocks to actually invest in. You know, if you're following them into a stock, they'll be in and out of stock in, inside the same day. Mm. You know, if you're actually following somebody and looking for ideas to research, you should be looking at people that actually invest in a stock for one year, two years, three years, four years, and not somebody who's going to be just in and out of a stock because that stock will not get out of its own way because the traders will be in and out with a frequency of I don't know what. Yeah. But there's, there's a really good point there that, you know, I mean, I, I've often said this. I think there's very few people, I think they're extremely rare breed, who can mix being a long-term investor with being a short-term trader. You get one or you get the other, the two combined is an incredibly rare beast. And I think as such, if you're a long-term investor, it is probably most useful to sort of hang around with long-term investors. If you're a short-term trader, hang around with short-term traders. And I think there's a lot of sense to that. And I think it's when you start trying to blur those lines that it, it, it bleeds into one another and you end up being rubbish at both of them. This is a quick hello to you, our valued Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener. Whatever channel you're listening to, please make sure to subscribe and you'll always be the first to get the new episodes. Thank you for your continued support. Cool. cool. I, I completely agree with you. There's, there's a question um, a couple of days back from our good friend, a child of the 70s, that at child of the Neil. 70s. Neil. Yeah. Hi, Neil. Yeah. Um, and Neil was posing this question, and, he's, and he said, and, he, and this is what he, he, he's written, so I'll just read it out. Mm. I'm looking for a fire and forget portfolio of ITs to see me through the next 15 years or so until retirement. Something to review once a year and rebalance. Should be growth rather than income. Considering 20% in BNKR, 20% in FCIT, 20% in SMT, 20% in CGT, and 20% in PL, right? Any opinions? And I looked at that and I thought, well, I could answer it on, on Twitter, um, but I'll answer it on, on this podcast. And one of the stocks that I wanted to hit, or one of the investments trust that I was going to recommend him to um, to have a look at, was what they talk about um, in the investments trust dividend heroes, Pete. These mm -hmm. are companies that have have increased their dividends for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. And um, the stock that I was going to say to him is is called, um, it's, it's BMO um, Global Smaller Companies Investment Trust. And the ticker is BG, BGSC. And it's, I think... BGSC. BGSC. 
Yeah. And it's I think it's at its fifty first year of um increasing dividends if I get my numbers and history right. Wow. And you know, so it's been around for a little while. If I've got that number wrong, you can all just, you know, give me a good smack across across the face. But it's a it's a dividend hero. It's been around for for a little while. Um I hope I've got that date right because someone was going to someone's going to chastise me. <laughs> um no, it's not 51. Yeah, it is actually because it was launched back in someone's got here on on the um, Morning Star um I'm sure that's not right. It says 1889. I'm not sure that's correct. I'm sure that's wrong. <laughs> well, but anyway, moving, that, move, you know, moving on, Pete. Essentially, it's, it's a, it invests in smaller companies worldwide yeah. yeah, in order to secure a higher return. And what I like about this, Pete, is I'm just looking back at the 10-year annualized and always look at the total annualized return on the stock. Yeah. So they're always improving and increasing the dividend, right? But this is quite a sleepy sort of... Um, um, return you think it would be anyway with the investment trust but you're compounding over 10 years total annualized 13.74 percent yeah it's excellent isn't five it? year 9.91 percent yeah three year 9.59 percent and obviously regarding the, the the one year we've had the, the the dip of last year a bit of an outsized 33 percent total returns for for this year whoa yeah yeah so it's it's there it's, it's global uh, the portfolio um, varies as as a as a global sort of reach, um, and you've you've got all manner of different things within underneath the bonnet of that, mm. you know, all around the world. You've got Jap- Japanese sort of holdings, American sort of holdings. Um, you've got industry, tech, consumer, cyclical, basic, healthcare, uh, defense, real estate, and energy. And I think it's one of those that you could you could buy, um, and actually leave it alone for for ages and just let it do its let it do its thing you know you don't have to worry about what the markets are going to do or, or not going to do uh, yeah, just, that, just that, leave, leave, leave it there to to just you know add to your compounding your your, your lazy spot. lazy easy just leave it be return which is brilliant way of investing and, and absolutely makes sense one day, one else a couple of things i'll say on that is I noticed that Neil talked about five funds. Yeah, that doesn't strike me as very many. Uh, that was that was just for a small portion of a of a, of a portfolio, I think. No, no, he was talking about twenty percent in each. So that's five. I would, I would, I understood that as five stocks for the okay, portfolio. Okay. Okay. Which to me, especially if you're going for growth, so it's all smaller stuff. That's... No, no, he's not looking for smaller stuff on all of them. I'm just saying one stock to actually one fund no, to actually he, consider he or, within that five would be this one. This is what I was saying. Another no, one to consider of the five that he's got already. No, he he said focus on growth. So what I'm saying is with the five he's mentioned, I think that's not enough stocks. I would say you need the minimum of eight, maybe ten. And I wouldn't just focus on growth. I would focus I would have growth, so say three or four out of your ten are growth, but then have something that's a little bit tamer, because otherwise you'll just because one of the dangers is if you just go for growth. Like if you buy all the stocks now for growth, growth's done really well. So you might find that you have several years of it really underperforming badly and you're going to be struggling in the first few years and you're going to be really disappointed with how it's going simply because you're in the wrong bit at the wrong time, simply because it had all done so well before. So having a sort of more diversification into other things would help perhaps. I mean, that's, what, that's possible. Yes, I agree. One, one stock that, funnily enough, I only discovered it this morning, and it just fits this topic brilliantly. And it really surprised me because I've been aware of these infrastructure trusts for quite a while. So so the the famous one is HICL. That's yeah. called, that's, I don't know what its proper name is, but that's one that, that you, you always sort of think of when you think of infrastructure trusts. So it invests in, like, um, toll roads and... Yeah, yeah. But whatever, you know, sort of like big infrastructure that has a, 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 a sort of income generation. Anyway, the one that stood out to me today is INPP, and that's International Public Partnerships or Private Partnerships, whatever it is. And if you, the thing that hit me is if you look at, if you've got a chart there of INPP, put up a chart of yep. INPP. Okie dokie. It's, 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 like you said, it's infrastructure, isn't it? It's yeah. Boring yeah. as hell, mate. Yeah, got it. Got the chart. And look at that chart over, like, say, 10 years. It just goes up. 
It's a beautiful chart. And you just think this, and, and obviously I think it's driven by inflation because obviously the, the, um, oh, wow. Yeah. It's got it. Yeah. You see what I mean? And, and like now, if you buy INPP now, it's got a four cash, according to SharePad, it's got a four cash yield of 4.4%. And then two year out, it's 4.5. So I think because of the nature of, of the infrastructure assets, you know, toll road, roads and stuff, um, that, that there's like an inflation link element to it, which is always going to mean that the valuation of the underlying assets goes up in thing, in value, and the, obviously the stream of revenue from the assets goes up in value, and your dividend goes up in value. All those things keep to drive the share price up quite nicely. And, and that's what you want. You want something that's it's resilient, you know. Yeah. Yeah. dealing with the peaks and troughs because if you look at that chart Pete, it's just a, sh a thing of beauty really yeah exactly it's got, it's whatever's come its way it's dealt with it's just remarkable yeah so you know? i mean like if you'd looked at the annualized return it's probably not amazing it's probably like eight or ten percent but the thing is again it's as, as a portfolio like we discussed a little of 10 stocks with some a bit racy having this in which is a little bit tamer might give it a bit more balance you know yeah just bear with me one second i'm just going to find what the annualized are so yeah. how they how they measure up? There was some yeah. news this morning on IMPP, and that was that they them and, and some other partners in a consortium have bought like um, like the links to an offshore wind farm thing. So it's like the cabling under the water or something. They've taken ownership of it, something like that. Right, just bear with me. I'm just going to find that. Right, so. I can't find it. Oh, it won't show me that, Pete, unfortunately, mate. Sorry. Okay. I don't hold it or anything. Things I usually use. It would be interesting to find out what the annualised is on that one. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, that, so that's that's where I'm at with, with that for um, for our our friend, Neil. Um, hopefully that helps. There's lots of others that you could um, investigate as well um, regarding that particular sort of um, area of portfolio um, allocation for funds. I think it's interesting, really, that more people are looking to to spread their wings into funds. And I think that's something that people should consider to have that level of diversity from direct um, investment in stocks um, to actually broaden out into funds where they can just leave it alone and let other people make the decisions for them over the long term, 10 years, 15 years. You know, um, why not? You know, you don't have to stare at your screen and be chasing and be worrying about it um, and worrying about what's going on with the markets that often. Um, yeah, there's a lot of sense to it. There's so. a lot of sense, Pete. I, on, on that note, Pete, and worrying yeah. and, and stressing and all the rest of it, um, I want to just take a moment, really, and, and talk to people, if I'm allowed to, um, to share a, a few concerns of mine and hopefully help a few people out um, with a sense of what's going on. Um, we're, we're again um, heading to... We're in November, December, and we're at a period where it's dark in the morning yeah and oh. dark in the evening and the change but, yeah and whether we whether we realize it or not um it does affect our moods and the, it does have a name and that name is seasonal affected disorder you know uh, and the 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 word used for it is sad sad yeah Works well. um, it's essentially it's, it's just a type of depression it's a depression it's a seasonal pattern and it's it's we all, we all go through it in different ways some of us don't feel that we're going through it um, but you know if I read any of these symptoms um, to out to people um, then ask you know ask the person next to you or the next person you see your colleague at work or the next person that comes to visit you or the next per next time you're out with anybody and ask them if they've had any of these symptoms and I'll guarantee you that they've had at least one right so a persistent low mood, a loss of pleasure or interest in normal everyday activities, irritability, feeling of despair, guilt or worthlessness, feeling lethargic, lacking in energy or sleepy during the day, sleeping for longer than normal and finding it hard to get out in the morning, craving carbs and gaining weight. <laughs> yeah? I got, I got all of that. <laughs> for some people, these symptoms can be severe and have, and have a significant impact on their day-to-day -day symptoms. But the reason why I'm, I'm, ringing, I'm bringing this up is because I find that this time of year, I'm not usually my joyous self, right? I have to, go, when, when it's nice out during this, you know, mid part of the day, I've got to get out and just do a bit of walking, whatever, and be out and about. Um, but the busier you get, sometimes you can't do that. So I suppose what I'm saying to everybody is 
we have to look out for each other, right? Um, we may not know it, right? But there are people in our circle that are not talking. And every year at this time of year, young people from the age of 25 up to 55, especially males, do not talk, do not communicate with each other, do not talk to their partners, their friends, their relations. And some of them will take their own lives, right? And all you, me and everyone else has to do to try and save at least one of those people is just to talk to them and ask them, are you all right? They can be the most jolliest person in the pub, right? On the phone. Oh, yeah. Right? But actually, there's some real deep stuff going on and stuff that they think is unsurmountable. And more often than not, it is. It is and it can be dealt with. And all they need is somebody else to just reach out to them and talk to them, right? So what I was going to ask people to do was basically, I've got a few things here, and obviously I'm talking as a former specialist working with, with people with mental health and, and all care needs and all manner of different things. So I don't, I'm not preaching to people now. I'm yeah. just saying, let's just have a little think. And if you can do anything for anybody else and just save one life just by reaching out and picking the phone up for somebody, even one of your, one of your, your own family, yeah, just check in on them, to see, see if they're all right, because the, it's, the it's dark days and nights are really, really hard for some people. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's wider than that as well, though, mate. And it? it's like, it's like, it's not just that. Yes, you might save some lives. You might actually save some people going through a lot of misery. You know? abs absolutely, yeah. absolutely. There so, aren't just the ones who who, who who don't manage to make it through. There's others who go through a lot of lot of. Absolutely. Struggles. So it's just a case of reaching out and just yeah. picking the phone up yeah. and being and being kind. So um, yeah. listen to what when people come come to you with, with any sort of symptoms or anything like that, just listen to them, right? Listen to what they have to say and be patient. Just let them get it all out because you might be the first person they've actually said, actually, you know, you're walking down the corridor, you've said to that person, you're right, you're right, Pete, how are you doing? And actually, I say for the first time ever, actually, I'm not okay. And you're thinking, oh, shit, I'm so busy, I haven't got time to listen to Pete. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I wish you hadn't said <laughs> but, that. <laughs> yeah, I wish I hadn't said that. But please just make the time. Please just make the time, right? Um, find out what the right support is signpost this person or just be patient and listen to them remind them that there's lots of lots of support out there for them yeah mm. help them organize and balance so if the family and friends help them to organize some of the some of the thoughts that, that that's going on and some of the things that they could actually get support from yeah if they're directly family related or even your own spouse try and learn about what the anxiety and social issues that they're going through to help them yeah the most important thing is don't keep pressuring them to talk about it. Let them come to you when they want to talk about it. Yeah. But the most important thing is to just keep in regular contact with them and just say, hello, just ring in, just ring in. Yeah. Just wanted to tell you about a bit of my day. Tell me about, about your day. Don't make it about the topic or the issue that they said they had a problem about. Yeah. And just make sure you look after them because, you know, we talk about investing. Yeah. I'm talking about someone's life here. Right. If the markets go Pete Tongue. You'd be talking about someone's well-being and their investing portfolio. You compound those two things together and you've got a mess. Oh, totally. totally. Yeah. So I know it's, it's off topic a little bit, but I've seen a few tweets. I've no. had a few conversations with people and we could do so much to help each other. So please excuse me. Just you, take um, this, this tangent and just look out for each other, please. Thank you. You you um, made an interest. One of the points you made in there really sort of struck me. You said, you said, let the person come to you and don't, mention the thing that's that's obviously causing the problem yeah and it's interesting you said that because because i can relate to that because i must say i find it quite sort of i don't want to upset all my friends now but i find it a bit irritating because i've had a pain now in my stomach for well about a year or something ridiculous yeah and it's been an absolute drag and i'm really obviously very fed up with it and but I must say, it sort of, it sort of is irritating when people say to you, "Oh, you know, how's your and it's how's how's your your pain now, or how's your your stomach now, whatever." And it's like, I don't want to be reminded of it, you know. It's like it's the last thing I'd flipping want. Ask me about something else, you know. It, it, do you sort of mean? And yeah, I think I, I do, Pete. This is why when I when think we speak, you really hit an important point there that. It's Which like is when, why, when we speak and... to, when we speak two or three times a week, I I don't start that conversation. No, absolutely. If we, if yeah. we go off and talk about you know your visit down to the new Lidl, 
yeah? yeah. Then yeah, that's what we exactly. talk about. If you want to then carry on talking about it and bring it back to talking about some of the stuff that's going on, then we talk about it. And I'm hoping to listening to you and, and, and being there for you for the next hour or so. And that's what we do. And that's what that's what think, people should do. You know what I mean? It's that learning learning strategy as well. I think that's Communicating a really, bit of it. really good point. You know, I think it's like when people have got a difficult issue, they don't want to be reminded of it all the time. Mm. You know, it's, yeah. Anyway, um, it also relates. There's, there's a real relationship here to the market. When you talked about, you know, SAD, seasonally affective disorder, it, it might be part of the reason that the market is so sort of weird at the moment and, and sort of, bit grindy and boring and and i think you know again it's that you know all the market participants have got sad as well they've all had their clocks changed they're all now stuck <laughs> and bored. It's rain. yeah it's raining outside and you know all the rest of it yeah and and they're they're all sleeping badly they're all eating carbs they're all worried because they're getting fat they're all, you know all those ex- anxieties are, are affecting the market par- participants yeah. and i think yeah. that also sort of explains why we're in this weird soggy time i think you could be right there pete it does it does affect affect us and i think the other thing to think about it is is that a lot of people we go back to this situation where you know those of us that are working yeah a lot mm. of it's hybrid we used to have that camaraderie in in the workplace, yeah. Investors and traders used oh, yeah. to, yeah, yeah. You know, these these big bankers used to all be in the workplace in various different settings. A lot of them aren't, Pete. A lot of them are working from home. I'm speaking to, speaking and interviewing fund managers. They're working from home, Pete. They've not been in the office, yeah. you yeah. know, for five days a week since last year. They're going in one or two or three days a week if they're, if they if they're lucky. So they're not having that, you know, that ooh, that little sort of frisson. I've already mm. call it with with their colleagues anymore, and finishing work at five o'clock and maybe going for a drink with colleagues. That's not happening as often anymore, you know. So true. Hey, um, I don't know if you if you noticed the tweet that I sent out about a week ago, or whatever. It was in response to something that Chris Dillo had written in the Investors Chronicle. Yeah, and it was I can't I can't even remember. I, what yes, Pete. It was about meditation and mindfulness. I know where you're going yeah. with this. Yeah, yes. well, that was it. It's like it's like I can't remember what the, the actual main part of the subject was about. Sorry, Chris, but um, but what I do, what I do, what I did really pick up on was this. It sort of said that you know meditation is obviously really good for us in so many ways, yeah. But there was one way in that for investors and traders, it could actually be a negative thing, and it was this idea that. That with meditation, where you're, you know, you 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 you're sort of, you're doing your breathing exercises and your yoga and you're trying to calm down and whatever. What you're sort of doing is is getting rid of your anxieties where you're worried about things that are going to happen in the future. That you're trying to live, you're trying to be in the present, in the now, in the moment. Yeah. And the danger is with that, and they they've done various experiments and stuff in in, in various universities. And the danger they find with it is that it makes investors sell stocks too early, and it 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 just it just creates habits that aren't actually good for your financial things. And and the solution that that they found is basically just don't ever rush a decision. You know, if you think to yourself, right, I'm gonna I've just meditated for half an hour. I'm now going to go and sell my BT shares. <laughs> Don't do it, all right? Hold yourself back. Think about it for another couple of days. And in another couple of days, you'll have reappraised the situation. You thought, well, yeah, I had a great meditation session. I was going to say, but actually, I think about it. I'm not going to sell it now. And that is probably the best way to do it. But I thought it was a really interesting thing. I was yeah. surprised by that. Yeah, it, it, it was basically saying that meditation, it seems, makes us more short-termist. Yes. In, our th- in our thinking and decision because making. we're trying to get in the now yeah I, I did reply to you Pete but as usual you didn't respond um, no, so, I was busy mate yeah 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 <laughs> uh, so I was, I was basically busy saying, dying. saying mindfulness and meditation have aided my long term investing objectives I wouldn't be where I am without it Pete you know what I mean because it yeah. helps me in the morning just get clarity yeah mm. and then in the evening it just calms me right down from all the different stuff I've read and researched and what I was saying was that um, the, the likes of Jeff Weiner, the CEO of LinkedIn, Bill Ford, the CEO of Ford, Oprah Winfrey, yeah. Um, what's this guy? I think I've got Wayne in my head. Um, 
the CEO of of, of Salesforce, John Ray Wayne. Dalio, John Wayne. And, um, I think it's Richard Simmons, um, the famous um, investor um, in businesses. They're all multi billionaires, mm. and they all do meditation and also mindfulness or or a type of that. And so did Steve Jobs. So and they've always looked long term. So you know the research has looked at um, individuals per se, but I'm not sure how many business leaders and people. Of, of billionaire stature that actually ended I up guess, in that particular piece. I guess it's different in a way because with a sort of billionaire or whatever, they aren't really making snap decisions that are going to affect the results instantly. Whereas, of course, when you're a trader or an investor, you can literally finish your media, your meditating session, come out and hit the sell button. And that yeah. that's where it's dangerous. Um, it also links to, I was down the um, pub few weeks ago we were a couple of good mates investing mates and um ian palmer was one of them i think he's at ilp 300 on twitter he's a really really nice guy and um we were talking about stuff and he said to me and i really picked up on it he said from talking to you and have because because ian's been investing a few years or whatever so he's not like massively experienced but he's really on the ball and he's learning all the right lessons and doing everything the right way and um and the thing that he said was, he said, from talking to me, he says, the things that he really noticed about how I behave and what I do with my investing, he says, you never make a fast decision. He says, when you think of buying a stock, you've been thinking about it for weeks. It's not like you don't get up one morning and say, right, I'm going to buy, buy, you know, RDSB today. It's like, no, that decision is something that I've made over several weeks and sort of what, and it's the same when I'm top slice or whatever. And he said that was the thing that really stood out to him about how I invest, which I thought was quite an interesting thing, which obviously is very different to the to the finishing your, your meditate and then it in the cell button. Yeah, I, th- I think it's important sometimes, Pete, um, to, to analyse. And I, th- I think that goes back to what I've said over and over again, and, and you know, quite a few people disagree with me. I think the, the, the correlation between the time you take to research, the time you take to make decisions, whether it be a buy or a sell, I think they correlate to the outcomes and the, the outperformance or lack of performance of your long-term portfolio. Um, I think people that make snap decisions that are in and out and churning and da 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 and trading 100 yeah. times a day, uh, 100 times a year, and have got you know every stock you know and have scattergunned all over the place, they've, they've not made refined filtered down decisions and, and that correlates to sometimes quite poor outcomes regarding their performance of, of their portfolio so your way of making decisions slowly thinking about it looking at it analyzing it will mean that your performance pete is better than somebody who's just going ah! and panicking you know that, that's totally like, how i see it yeah good news and they're out there's no conviction it's like i'm going to hold this stock forever but tiny bit of bad news or it, or the trading update comes out and it's not that great and it's I've sold. Yeah, it's and the button. obviously the worst ones on on Twitter are the ones that hold a stock, hold a stock, talk about the stock, and then the minute the profit warning comes, they've sold it last week. It's like you never mentioned anything about that stock last week. <laughs> How can you today say you've sold it? But you know, it is what it is, Pete. You know, everyone makes decisions and everyone projects what they want to project. But you know, the best way to be is to be honest. Yeah, exactly. But no, thanks. Thanks for Ian for pointing it out. Do you know, it's funny because I meet with a lot of other investors. Well, I'm sadly, not as much as I want to. Um, but I meet with you know, other investors, particularly over the summer this year. I've managed to do it quite a lot. And it's funny because sometimes it actually takes someone else saying to you, you're doing things this way for you to really realize how important that is, if you see what I mean. And, and, this, is the, and this is the reason why we do these podcasts, Pete, because you, you're taking the time to give back and pay it forward about your learning and then you do it again in your tweets and you do it again in your blogs and your, and your website yeah and this is it you're doing all this to help your learning and other absolutely. people learning fr- and other people learning from it are you with me absolutely it's it's reinforcing reinforcing if i have a good behavior it's encouraging me yeah. it goes back to that thing we were saying before a couple of podcasts ago compounding knowledge and you're saying you've almost got that that deposit box in the back of your brain just churning and sourcing and filtering and containing all that information so sometimes when somebody says pete what do you think of that stock you're thinking ah i remember that stock and i don't like it because of this reason yeah <laughs> well what I mean? marks and spencer yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> i've just found that person's name from a uh, ceo of um of, of um salesforce pete and it's mark with a c uh benioff i think it's, it's how you pronounce it 
Whether you are an experienced or new investor, you know how valuable it is to conduct portfolio enhancing analysis and to have easy access to data that will give you the edge. As a Twin Peaks investing podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only and you can subscribe using the promo code TWINPEATS. The incredible and exclusive offer means that monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the TWINPEATS promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need. Right, Pete, um, I want to come up to speed now with our um, Twin Peaks challenge. Yeah. Uh, how that's going. Um, once again, folks, thank you ever so much for your support. For those of you that wish to support us, please, please, please do so. Um, I might come up with an idea for a last little push into Christmas. But the Just Giving page is justgiving.com forward slash fundraising Twin Peaks Challenge. Now, on the last podcast, I mentioned an invitation to London. Um, a chap called David rang me up. Wasn't, wasn't a friend of mine. Didn't know who he was. He invited me to London uh, for a day out. Invite, invited me to the Savoy. And I said, no. Um, David had saved himself um, 260k plus from selling um, Games Workshop shares and they dropped down to about 95 quid. And he was very, very pleased with himself. So he wanted to take me out for a treat. And I said in the last podcast, um, I brought you guys up to speed with that. And I told David at the time of the phone call, no, absolutely not. There's loads of kids out there, loads of other people out there that could do with some help. And we're doing this Twin Peaks charity thing. So I can't be doing that. So if you can kindly make a donation, please make a donation. And I called him out on the last podcast. I said, David, just, you know, if you can, you're still there and you're willing to even donate 10 pounds right absolutely the the twin peaks challenge had a mystery donor um Ooh. supporter dropping into the challenge three thousand oh, pounds plus fantastic. 750 pounds gift aid and the only thing i've got on it is the initials dm keen with an e and the words, great show. So that £3,750 have been added by one individual. That's awesome. Just saying, great show. Is that David? I don't know. Who who knows? But if it is David, thank you very much. If it isn't David, mystery person, whoever you are, thank you so much. A- absolutely, mate. That's going to absolutely do so much good. Um, the other people that have made a don- donation were Chris Gilbert. And his words were, great work, guys. And... A more than worthwhile cause. Um, twenty pounds plus five pounds gift aid. Brilliant. KG, great podcast. Donated fifty pounds. Good old Terry once again. Um, take care and keep safe. Donated two pounds. Yeah. Anonymous person donated ten pounds and two pounds fifty gift aid. Our total, as we stand at the moment, is let me get the right number here. Is eighteen thousand one hundred and forty-eight pounds and sixty-eight pence. Marvelous. That is what we have generated from you ladies and gents who have been supporters um it's sitting at 201 supporters at the moment from two and a half thousand listens so there's still time for you others to join in um some of those have donated um, several times like terry and scrumpy and others um so we're looking to get in the next five weeks towards um to smash 20k and if we can that'll be absolutely awesome uh but dm keen i'm not sure what to say but you've absolutely smashed it there and just want to thank you ever so much dm keen for doing that and if you're listening to this show um i'll take you to the savoy in london (laughs) next year if you want me to um just to show show a a big thank you um what i've done already um after a conversation with um the the main fundraiser of memphis he's had a chat conversation with me and the participants that have already donated including dm keen that have donated we are going to be in a position where we've used some of that money prior to Christmas and we're going to be purchasing 250 plus 
gifts for disabled and vulnerable young people in the Leicestershire community and we'll be going out and delivering those by hand to these people in the community um, in and around Christmas so that's something else I'm going to be doing in and around Christmas with yes, with uh, with Memphis so so yeah so I'm absolutely thrilled to be doing that and the rest of the money when we when we've finished at the end of December 31st we'll be going towards buying a big piece of kit for the unit so thank you all ladies and gents for your support with that Really, really no, that, that's awesome and uh, can I reiterate again thank you so much people and if you can help us get us over that that 20,000 well and more you know let's let's keep it going um what I will I just wanted to say quickly note that you can donate as an anonymous you know so if you if you if you want to give money but you're a little bit sort of nervous about sticking your, your exact name whatever I understand that but just you know give us give us 20 quid as an anonymous or whatever yeah yeah, you don't have to write a name or anything. Just put anonymous yeah. and, and whatever the amount you want, whether it be two pounds or whatever the amount is. You know, um, it all helps. Every every single penny helps, and you can make a difference to a, a young person or a young adult's life that's um, disabled and in need. Oh, absolutely. You know? So absolutely. really, really good. Thank you all very, very much. Pete, we're pushing on. So do you want to share some stocks? Do you know what? I'll just do. A, I've got a couple here that I can throw in, but but one uh, quick one that you. You mentioned it sort of indirectly a few minutes ago. You didn't even realize you did it. Um, I was reading something, probably in Investor's Chronicle, where they were going about Tesla and all the rest of it and all the electric cars and blah, blah, blah. Um, one of the shares that came up that they said looked interesting, and I think there's a lot of sense to this. It's good old Ford, you know, in America. Yeah, so it's, it's dollar sign F is the EPIC cut, you know, the TIDM code. And it's on a forward PE of nine, which, you know, just seems really good value. Well, outstanding value, to be quite honest. And um, I reckon that could be quite an interesting play. And it's, it's along the lines of what we said earlier, where, you know, these big, big established behemoth kind of companies, you know, they may go through a, a difficult period, but they quite often emerge in pretty good shape. And and I think it's pretty safe to say that companies like Ford, obviously Volkswagen, Toyota, Honda, blah, 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 they're all getting into EVs in a big way. It isn't just Tesla or Rivian or all these other ones. And yet the market seems to think that, that, that it's only Tesla making cars. I mean, it's just completely daft. And, uh, and it was even taught that, that Tesla might take Ford over. So it was just quite a bizarre thought. It's an interesting one with Ford, Pete, because obviously they're on they're up on their absolute knees, weren't they, um, for for a good for a good while and uh, really really struggling. But I, I think the the beauty of it is is that they, they are the 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 the, Amer the American marquee brand, aren't they? You know, totally. Um, so so if they're going to pretty much the, the industry, didn't they? Really? Yeah, they started the industry. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So they they've been on a, a bit of a, a renaissance, really, with investors. Um, over the past couple of years, um, after, after being absolutely s smashed um, back in 2008 when they were absolutely on their knees um, as such, and 2009, um, under $2 a share, and everyone was saying they're going to be going out of business, you know, um, and they've, they've really just, you know, had to grind as you, the word that you keep using you know, yeah. the way up, and then they got smashed again last year back down from um ten dollars a share um to five dollars a share um when everything got sold off it last last march uh, february and they're sitting now at, at nearly twenty dollars a share um it's still a, a 79 billion dollar company but as you touched on you've got um rivian which has just um ipo'd yeah um i don't think it's sold a vehicle yet and no, it's IPO, made one, is it? <laughs> hasn't sold a vehicle yet, Pete. And the IPO with a value of 130 billion or, or something daft like that. And it's like, okay. how, how how does how do you put a value on a brand new entity because it's in that niche and give it that sort of value? Oh, it's because that person's involved in it. And that person's bought a stake in it, and therefore it must be worth 100, 130, 140 billion. I'm like, I'm I'm going really. So yeah, you know, I said I think I said to you last time we we're talking about companies and electric vehicles um, thing when we had um, Tim Rogers on Volkswagen was one of them I mentioned I thought Absolutely, that would do yeah. well so Volkswagen yeah. Ford um, could be the ones that are, they're, they're profitable they're making money um, there was talk just recently that 
Um, was it Volkswagen might be buying McLaren? Did you see that conversation, Pete? No, I didn't see that. That's interesting. I think I think I saw something about that, and they might be getting back into um, back into Formula One or supercars. I've often uh, heard that about him going back into Formula One. That's that's often seen. So that was quite an interesting thing. Um, so I, I I don't know. There's 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 lots of talk, and I think there's lots of space for for companies to make make good. Um, lots of opportunities there mm. in, in that space. But um, Ford is a good call, Pete. I I like your your call on that. So yeah, so yeah. it's Volkswagen Audi to buy McLaren. That's what the talk is about. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting, mate. So Ford, yeah, one to watch, mate. Definitely. Another another one that that keeps coming up. I don't I, I don't hold it. I did I don't hold Ford. One that keeps coming up, and it's it's along that sort of income share kind of line, and it's good old DLG Direct Line Group. Yeah. And stop. Yeah. Stop. Go on. I had a conversation just last week with somebody. Right. Oh, yeah. And they ring me up on the phone and they say, oh, what do you think about that? And I, and I pointedly did. I just said, oh, it's an interesting company. Said, Have you looked at it, Pete? Yes, I've looked at it, Pete. I've looked at it, mate. And I, I refuse to say I hold that share. Oh, no. I only recently bought that, Pete. I've <clears> no <throat> intention of telling anybody about it. I, uh, I think I'm going to have to just disclose to, to you all my stocks so you don't keep piping up about them. on this podcast, mate. That's so funny, mate. I mean, just annoys me. Yeah, <laughs> that is a classic. I'm that not is... talking about it. You can carry on. I'm getting a pretty good hit rate nearly every episode now. It's I managed to find good, mate. Not good. Managed to find There's one. There's a reason why I don't say anything about these stocks, Pete. Because <laughs> people say, "Oh, he talks all, all they do on there is talk about your stocks." Oh, he, oh, he, he comes no. on there and never talks about your stocks. You can't please these people, mate. You know what I mean? I got don't no. Don't say anything. I got no idea what you hold. Um. On DLG, then the the um, if you just look at the PEs and stuff, it's like forecast PE of ten point five and two year nine point eight, whatever. But the really interesting bit is the forecast yield is nine percent, and the two year forecast yield is eight point nine. Now I suspect I might be wrong, but I think there's an element of special dividend in there, so people would need to look into that if they were to consider it. But it just you know when you think about quality established brands that have been around for a long time with a good history it's hard to beat something like dlg as a, as a boring stick it in your income portfolio you know it's not going to be fireworks by any means but it'd be just a nice steady eddy i think would you like me to comment at all pete well you might as well give your reasons as to why you hold it <laughs> Make sense. I'm holding it for those reasons, mate. It's a boring, steady anything, um, compounding my portfolio. Uh, I've got cash sitting there doing nothing, and there's a tiny outside chance they'll do something, you know, um, innovative with what's going on. They've done nothing for five years, really. The shares. It's just one of those drip, drip, drip of dividends. Um, if they do something, if there's any activists involved, if there's something, somebody comes in and goes, you know, we'll put you out of your misery, then there's a chance the shares get a pop. Uh, so I bought it for the dividends and possibly a recovery or new people get parachuted in to actually shake it up a little bit. Um, so that's why I bought it. I'm looking looking at the one year chart and it's sort of at its sort of one year lows at the moment, you know, just just a little bit off that. And it it's sort of got up to a peak and then it's fallen back. Um, and it's probably still in a bit of a downtrend, major downtrend at the moment. But I reckon it's one to keep keep an eye on, and at some point it could be very good to get buy. Well, you know, it's almost like buy a starter position and get going with it kind of stock. And then once you're in it, you can always add more as time goes on. Um, but I, I always find that if I buy a starter position and I'm in it, I take more notice of it. If I if I find a good company, I think, oh yeah, I'm really thinking I might buy that, and then I don't buy it, I forget about it. Something else comes along that takes my interest, and you know. So quite often, actually, getting your foot in the door, buying a starter position, and then adding to it over time is, is quite a good approach, I think. I, I, I definitely agree with that, Pete. I think it's, it's important to to get a little bit of a. It makes you want to research it more, find out a bit more information about it, and 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 monitor it accordingly. 
I think the important thing to do is always, always, always monitor stock, research the stock, and make sure that you've got as much information as you possibly can regarding it. And you'll never know enough about it. So, so do, so do what you can um, okay. regarding getting as much information about it. I, I want to mention a stock which I've kept my eye on for a little while, Pete, and I refuse to buy it. I think I might have mentioned it briefly before. Yeah. Um, and it's some, it's a stock that I'm interested in, and I've, I've spoken to some people, and they don't like the stock particularly. Uh, but I like my tech. Um, and and the, the importance of data going forward. Um, we're in the data stream now, and everything we do is being churned and, and profiteered by somebody else. But cybersecurity firm Dark Trace um, IPO'd and completely popped and raced away, and I didn't get the opportunity to, to buy it. The ticker symbol is D A R K, and yeah. it's one I've got my eye on, Pete. It's um, it's just gone up. It's drifting down again. Um, I like the fact they're in that space. The revenue is is quite slim, really, in comparison to its its market cap. Um, its market cap is currently just just sub four billion. Um, but it came out of the the IPO, popped, raced up to um, to ten pounds. It's currently back down now at five forty four. Um, I'd like it to come down a bit lower before I buy it. It looks to me like it will, to be honest. I mean, yeah, it could well do. The momentum's come yeah. out. The people that profiteered from the IPO uh, are already are already selling it back to the people that didn't get a chance to <laughs> to get it at the IPO. Um, so I suspect that some institutions um, are, are selling. I'm not sure what the locking was with with Dark Trace, um, but maybe that's what's, what's that's what's happening there's, there. Um, so at the start, there's there's support back in sort of mid-August and there's like a hammer candle and that would have been around say £5.30 and today it's closed at 5.44 I reckon if that 5.30 goes then it's going to drop right back to sort of 400 maybe even back to the IPO levels. Yeah, I IPO'd at um, £2.50 and then raced away to £10 so some people have made a lot of money um, but the fact it popped on the first day I was like oh you know what I mean? It was like 44, 45% on the first day. I was thinking, nah. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not chasing that. And then it just carried on higher and higher it's, and higher. It's like you yeah. said, the issue it's got and the reason that it's going to probably find it hard to, to make headway is it, the valuation is so extreme. Even, you know, even now it's dropped back. It's still an extremely high valuation. I'm just trying to actually get the numbers on it. You probably share. won't because it's an IPO peak because I've got nothing historic there. I, that the rev it, 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 what I found with SharePad, which is quite neat, is that quite often you don't get any forecasts for um, earnings or whatever. Yeah. But if you look under the the financials tab, I have to try and I'm doing it on my little tablet and it's a lot harder to see it. Um, yeah, forecasts. And I look under there. Quite often it has revenue forecasts on these kind of stocks, which can be really yeah, you know, it just gives you a really good idea. So, yeah, it's got it. Right, here we go. So, if you look at the turnover forecast on Dark, it's got 2022 forecast revenue, or turnover revenue, yeah, at 388 million. Then in 2023, it's 510.9 million. Then 2024, 640.7 million. Growing at sort of 31, yeah, ran at 30% a year. Now, as as we said, against what was what you say the market cap was about four billion. Just just sub four million at the moment, yeah. Yeah, so at four billion, and it's it's expected to do, you know, five hundred million of revenue. And that's in dollars actually, so it's so it's even less. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's you just sort of think. I mean, actually looking at it's actually got profit forecasts in here. So they're talking about earnings per share. Well, they're talking about losing. Losing 1.93 cents per share in 2023, and losing 2.1 cents per share in 2024. So, yeah, I just think what you know, you if if things go right, then you know it it can recover sort of thing. But I think with a valuation that stretch, it's going to come under pressure for a while, most likely. I would have thought. Yeah, they, they need to come up with some more revenues and also hit profitability at, at probably ahead of time. But then you you you, you, you spoke of um, Rivian. Rivian hasn't even got revenues. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, this is it. 
and, and, it's, and it's worth 130 bit well it's it's market value was whether it's worth that or not is another matter but it's market cap was 130 billion so it, I, I don't know pete that's what happens with tech sometimes and you've got to pay up for it sometimes yeah you know uh, people refuse to pay up for for apple um refuse to pay up for amazon refuse to pay for pay up for microsoft and, and it's just they just carried on climbing so sometimes right. you have to pay for it Am I right in thinking that the, the novel thing about Dark Trace is that when it comes to cybersecurity, they're sort of using like AI within the network and machine learning yes, kind of stuff. That's what yeah. catches my attention. Which is pretty the, neat. The it's, pretty, it's pretty neat, the tech. Pretty neat, yeah. And it's got some massive, you know, global entities that are using it as well. So mm. AI machine learning, yeah, um, is, is the thing. Definitely, definitely. Because I think the way I understood it is that normal cybersecurity, yeah, it's like the threat comes along, so, so, the, so the virus, whatever it is, comes along and attacks the network, and then the cybersecurity company designs a solution to fix that and stop it happening. Whereas with Dark Trace, it's a completely different approach. It's more about sort of predicting what the next attack is likely to be and actually having a solution ready for it before it even comes. That's how I sort of understood it, something yeah. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. It's, it's like a much more responsive network, I think, is the, is the logic behind it. So, you, you know, if, if, if they can get that working well, then, yeah, that, that you can see why it would be worth a lot of money. Absolutely. I, I suppose I'm going to throw one more stock in there before we close, on, Pete. Okay. Um, I, want to, I want to talk about um, it was just today's um, numbers um, from, you know, we spoke of Nightcap last time, didn't we, Pete? Yeah. Um, having a really good pop and surprising people. The other one today that surprised a few people, and maybe it shouldn't have been that big a surprise, really, um, was the Wagamama owner restaurant group. Yeah. yeah. That popped today. I think it was 17%, 18%. Um, and it's increased its full year uh, profit guidance. Um, and the beauty of doing this one, I think what really shook the market up was this was an, un this was an unplanned trading update. Yeah. It wasn't scheduled to be given in a trading update. And it just came out and went, like to report. You know what I mean, um, so yeah, so it's continued um, growth across o operations, like for light like growth ahead of the market, and because there's travel are opening, you know, the airports and so on and so forth. What it was saying that if you read the RNS quite deeply, was that it's airport concessions business, right, Pete? Yeah. Uh, so when you're going out, you know, these people go on holiday. Oh, just before I fly, let me just go into Wagamama's or whatever the other bits and pieces they've got in the airport that started to climb up again yeah? yeah a little bit of improvement there because uk passenger numbers are going up so you know if that continues and more and more people are traveling abroad and traveling at christmas to visit their friends and family overseas or you know in europe or whatever that could do quite well so that had a pop today so it's an interesting you know because i've been like oh. pubs restaurant eh, eh, staying well away yeah um, so, but it's nice to see those um, sort of companies climbing back um, finished up 16.7 percent i'm just checking you know, you at 92.6 pence today pete you said it earlier that, that one of the stocks we were talking about popped a lot and it was probably because there was a lot of short interest i suspect rtn is in that category as well to jump 6.8 percent it was probably a lot of shorter yeah 16.7 percent 16, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, 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 think, I think you could be right mate i think you could be right but the interesting thing on here is that Sherpad showing two year forecast PE is 28.6, but that's based on old forecasts. The forecast mm. is having to get upgraded. So the actual two year forecast PE will actually be lower. Yes. But of course, the, the issue then you get is what we were talking about earlier about if COVID's going to make a comeback, are they yeah, suddenly going to find you've, it? You've, you've, got to caveat, you've, you've got to caveat it with the unknown. And this, sure, is, yeah. this, is, this, this, is, this is investing. Every investing that you and I do and yeah. anybody else does is layered with uncertainty. It doesn't yeah. matter how much you've researched it or how little you've researched it or who gave you the, the, the idea or where you got the idea from. There's no guarantee of success, folks. No totally, guarantee. Totally, which is, which is why you need a diversified portfolio. Which is why you need a diversified risk, portfolio. Risk yeah. management. And, and all you've the... also got to build up your own resilience and psychology of dealing with the peaks, the troughs, and yeah. the indifference of the market. The market don't care whether you like it or not. And you can't re get revenge on the market. It'll just do whatever it wants to do. So you have to get stronger to deal with it over many, many, many years. And if you're scared now, just wait until the market goes absolutely belly up. You have to be ready for it, folks. 
yeah, yeah. That's, that's... So, talking about resilience Pete, i want to close and people w probably will get this now on friday but on thursday night i'm i'm taking a deep dive in uh in doing a q and a interview live with lots of business leaders on the behalf of memphis who we did the charity function for excellent um and we've got um at marathon champ um doing a q and a with business leaders it'll be about 70 to 100 business leaders on on thursday evening i've invited a few um guests to that event um on thursday who live in and around leicestershire and that's with richard whitehead mbe who's a double paralympian 200 meter gold medalist and marathon record holder um and he's also did a, a, a I forget what year it was now he did a four foot ran 40 marathons in 40 days and this guy oh. obviously <laughs> as, as people know is a disabled um you know double amputee um, runner, marathon runner, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. That's incredible. A phenomenal, phenomenal individual that's represented um, Team GB at Olympics since 2016. So I'll be interviewing him on Thursday. So please wish me luck. I'm absolutely petrified. It's not something I've done before in a sense of uh, Q&A with loads of business leaders looking at me looking, who's this guy? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, so yeah. uh, that's what's happening Thursday. So... Yeah, we shall see how that goes. But oh, good, good luck with that, mate, because that's that that'll be um be, that'll be a good thing to do, you know. And uh, I mean, I can't get my head around even the idea of running one marathon when you've had you know double amputee and to do what was it forty marathons in forty, 40 marathons in forty days, mate. Yeah. How is that possible? I just yeah, it's some pure, of the big... pure endurance, mate, and making sure you've got several physios to get rid of all that that oh. acid that's building up around your body, you know. Some of the things people do, you just think it's just absolutely stunning what people do it just shows what the human being can do if it, mm -hmm. if it pushes itself you know yeah it's, it's been a, it's been an absolute phenomenon uh richard has you know it's, it started swimming at the age of four pete you know and he's been yeah. carried carried on doing sports ever since then you know and he's, he's done lots of good for for, for everybody really and then ensuring that everybody can and does a, try to achieve their full potential so that's i'm looking forward to meeting him and, and speaking with him That'd be good. That'd be good, mate. Okie dokie. Anything else you want to add, Pete? No, I think we're pretty much there. Uh, thanks to everyone for the donations to the to the, to the um, charity, and uh, thanks for your continuing support and all your thanks on Twitter and, and and the personal ones around my problems. And yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Cool. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat Pete's sentiments there. Thank you ever so much for the, for the feedback, folks. Uh, the good, the bad, the indifferent. We take it. We learn from it. We try to improve. Um, we went off at a bit of a tangent. I hope you'll accept our, our apology regarding the SAD stuff. Um, but please pick up the phone if you can when you hear this and just reach out and just try and find out, see, help, support and just send some good wishes to some people you may not have spoken to for a little while. Um, until we speak to you in two weeks' time, um, take care, God bless, keep yourself safe and bring as much cheer into other people's lives as you can and pay it forward. Take care, God bless. See ya. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage.